12, 2019 is recalled to order. Marilyn, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? There are. I have two forms. Do, does anyone else have a form they want to submit? <laughs> okay. Uh, let me quickly, I hope quickly, read the um, rules for public participation. Each speaker will be limited to five minutes to address the board. If you have handouts, please pass them to the person closest to you at the table. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. However, you may be contacted after the board meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people and disrespecting anyone by name will be gaveled down and asked to cease. We will be strictly following the time limits so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. And our first speaker is Mike Flanagan, followed by Jessica Murphy. Those are the only two forms I have. I don't want to be gaveled down, so I'll... <laughs> yeah, you behave, Mike. Stay within the rules. <laughs> yeah. I, um, good afternoon. Um, Thank you. My name is Grandpa Flanagan. I'm, uh, no videos? Sorry. Tired Grandpa Flanagan. <laughs> yeah, tired Grandpa. And uh, the, the, they now call me Crazy Grandpa. I think, I think that's meant to be nice. Um, I'm not sure. And I, I wanted to be here for a couple of reasons. I didn't have a chance to make Mike's welcoming, so I wanted to mention something a little bit later, uh, you know, 15 minutes in or whenever, you know, five <laughs> minutes and then Marty goes on and on and on later. <laughs> but I wanted to do two things. One is I uh, wanted to congratulate Sheila. I don't see her here, but that, that's a tough duty to, uh, to take over in that interim time. And, um, and I want to just say I was a local superintendent. I was a superintendent at RESA, uh, Wayne RESA, head of the Superintendent Association. But the best team I ever worked with, as, as good as all these other folks were, were here at SBE, um, to a person. Uh, the board, I really appreciate your support, and uh, I, I appreciate it more looking back now, to tell you the truth. You kind of take things for granted when you're in the middle of it. Did about 100 meetings where you're sitting, Mike. Um, you don't want to do that many if you can prevent it. Um, and, you know, to a person, I mean, the team I had back there with uh, Mertz, of course, and Allison, Karen, Maureen, I probably shouldn't start because then all Marty, the deputies, these are really great people. Um, I was happy to see uh, the, the process you went through as a board. Um, but I was wondering, you know, I'm getting kind of antsy and I was, uh, I'm at a point where I'm getting kind of bored even though I've got seven grandkids and they're great. So I was kind of wondering, when do you think the state superintendent job will be open again? Do you, <laughs> do you see that? I mean, Mike could be a university president before you know it. I remember I was one vote away from being a university president and uh, not, not bitter. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, but on a serious note, I, I wanted to do the two things. One was just to thank you for the opportunity here and say how much I appreciated working with the team here. And then also, Mike, I, I didn't know until I was retiring that uh, there was some mocking going on about me using Lion King apparently more than twice. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, you know, I used to show, Michelle, as you know, I'd show every time we had a new grandkid, we had five of them while I was here, I would show a video. So we've had two since then, uh, Joey in Brooklyn, so I thought I thought I ought to catch up with them. <laughs> you have a video? <laughs> I'm messing with you. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. Uh, what I wanted to say, though, Mike, based on uh, support for you, sorry I wasn't able to make my busy retirement schedule. You're, you're welcoming. <laughs> but I thought since you're kind of the new and improved version 3.0 of... Uh, State Superintendent Mike and I was the old version that I had the old copy and the old film of Lion King. I wanted to give you as a gift the new version and the new Lion King. Wish you well. Oh, that's too funny. Don't overuse it. Promise you. Have a good meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Superintendent. <laughs> Superintendent, the an Superintendent, the answer to your question is Christmas. <laughs> Our next speaker. You have to see that one. <laughs> uh, 
Hello, uh, my name is Jessica Murphy, and I'm here on behalf of Michigan Protection and Advocacy Service Incorporated and PASS, um, the agency mandated by state and federal law to protect and advocate for the rights of individuals with disabilities. Our work includes protecting the legal rights of students with disabilities and their families when it comes to education in the school setting. MPASS gets around 1,200 calls per year related to questions or concerns about students with disabilities and school. Another representative from MPASS and I attended the Subbing Out Teacher Solutions Summit presented by the Center for Michigan on November 7, 2019. Dr. Pamela Pugh was one of the expert panelists who participated in the discussion. And after participating in the evening's discussion, MPAS feels it is important to alert the State Board of Education to how the issues directly impact students with disabilities. MPAS recognizes that the increased reliance on long-term substitute teachers has the potential to impact all students, but it is much more likely to negatively impact the outcomes of the most vulnerable students, including students with disabilities. Over 200,000 Michigan students, roughly 13% of all students, are eligible for special education. These students are entitled to a free, appropriate public education, including special education and related services. <coughs> the state of Michigan is required by federal law to ensure that these students are being taught by personnel who have appropriate content knowledge and skills. In our experience, teachers who do not have the proper skills and training do not always recognize an individualized education program or an IEP the document of student tailored supports and services required to provide a free and appropriate public education without being able to recognize an IEP students are not or teachers are not prepared to provide the appropriate services and accommodations that many students need to access the general education curriculum and find continued Thank success you. in school additionally with schools reporting a rise in students exhibiting challenging behaviors and displaying the effects of trauma very often by students in the special education population and often in struggling urban schools. It is essential that teachers be well versed in positive behavior supports and be able to implement behavior intervention plans with integrity. Untrained long-term substitute teachers may not have the skills necessary to prevent or de-escalate challenging behaviors and their responses will likely cause more harm than good, potentially leading to higher rates of seclusion and restraint and suspension and expulsion. The Michigan Department of Education, including the Office of Special Education, must take steps to ensure that every classroom in Michigan has a fully credentialed and adequately trained teacher and must ensure that each of those teachers has the skills to educate both typical students and students with disabilities. And my contact information is on the bottom if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe that concludes public participation. Thank you. The next item on the committee, the whole agenda, is presentation on increases in career and technical education enrollment, programming, and completion. This presentation will provide uh, data around career and technical education enrollment, programming, and completion. This presentation is informational, requires no board action. There will be additional presentations on post-secondary credit earning opportunities in future months. Board, be aware that this is part of a series of presentations that we are going to share with you. And uh, the purpose of these presentations is multifold. One, we want you to know about individual areas of education in our state. So we had our young people present from our early college program. We wanted you to see young people, hear from young people, understand about that program. We want you similarly to hear today on career and technical education this afternoon <coughs> and the positive oh, trends in that area. Bless you. The second thing, the second logic associated with this is to see a series of improvements because we as public educators don't necessarily do the best job of telling our story. And there's more story to public education, as the board is well aware, than any single metric or metrics. So we're going to be sharing with you the widest range of metrics over a period of months so that you have the fullest understanding. And so by extension, our community has the fullest understanding of where we are in terms of public education in the state. Not simply where we are, but where we're trending to. And we think that there's some value um, associated with that. We also think that there is some value 
associated with you digging into these discrete areas and understanding the relationships among them. So in the next several months, you'll hear not simply about early college and career and technical education. You also hear about early middle college, dual enrollment more broadly, IB, and AP. And those are all areas in high school that tend to lead to high school graduation and some form of post-secondary work, whether it be a four-year degree, a two-year degree, an apprenticeship, a certificate of achievement, a certificate. One way or the other, if you are in one of these programs, you are far more likely to continue your education, far more likely to graduate from high school, far more likely to continue on into something associated with post-secondary credentialing. The governor has set a goal of 60% of our adults having a post-secondary credential by 2030. We're currently at 43.7% in our state. The data that Dr. Kenigschnecht and Dr. Piles are going to present in just one moment uh, give us reason to believe that in this particular area of career and technical education, we're trending extremely positively and that that will affect positively <coughs> that 60 by 30 metric. 75% more kids completing CTE programs than four years ago. That's a big deal. So I welcome Dr. Scott Kenigschneck, Deputy Superintendent P20 System and Student Transitions, and Dr. Brian Piles, Director of Career and Technical Education, to our uh, board meeting to give us the extensive view of all things career and technical education. Gentlemen. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rice, for putting our presentation into context. And we are very excited um, to share some very positive trends with you regarding career and technical education um, this afternoon. So I'm joined by Dr. Piles, <clears throat> as the Office Director for the Office of Career and Technical Education. And we'll present together and certainly field questions um, uh, either as we go or if you would like to pose them at the end, that's, that's certainly fine as well. So what you're going to see in the presentation is a number of what we're calling CTE data facts. Um, and before we get into some of the data facts, just uh, one of the definitions you're going to see is uh, CTE completer. Um, you may wonder, well, what does that mean? A CTE completer um, is a secondary student um, who's done three things in a sense. They've completed the courses covering all program standards in a state-approved CTE program, and they've taken the required technical skills assessment for that program. You'll see the asterisk at the bottom, in completing the courses, they have to complete the courses uh, to be considered a completer. They have to consider or complete those courses with a grade point of 2.0 or higher. And so some of the students who are enrolled in CTE aren't completers. They still go every day, they still get grades, they still earn credit, but they're not recognized as quote unquote completers. Um, and so when we start talking about the difference between the two, a completer is somebody, again, who has completed the courses covering all program standards. Uh, with a 2.0 and has taken the required technical skills assessment for that particular program. So with that, let's take a, a broad look at all su uh, students who have been enrolled uh, in career and technical education programs over the past five years. And what you'll see, again, Dr. Rice alluded to a lot of this, um, is a very positive trend. Um, the five-year trend um, from 2014-2015 uh, to 2018-19 shows an increase from about 104,000 students up to about 110,000 students. And what that means is a 6.22% increase in students uh, enrolling in career and technical education courses uh, across our state. So overall, career and technical education enrollment is up, and it's a positive thing. This is where we get into completers, um, and this is um, even more exciting news for us. So of the 110,000 students uh, in 1819, 104 in 1415, these are the numbers of students that actually completed. So they met those two requirements. They completed all of the, the course requirements with the 2.0, uh, and they also passed uh, the technical skills assessment. And, and you can see how that number has risen dramatically over the past five years, from 27,000 uh, in 14 to 47,354. That's a 75% increase of our, our youngsters enrolled in these programs um, who are being considered as completers. Um, so we're very excited about um, that increase as well. This is the actual number of career and technical education programs across the state. 
and this, again, this is the positive trend we spoke of, oh. a five-year period, the number of programs being offered is increasing um, very rapidly as well, um, from 1,754 to this past year, 2,078. And so we're, we're allowing, uh, <laughs> districts are allowing more access to programs um, to the students within those particular districts. That increase is about an 18% increase, 18.47. Uh, and so um, we're excited about the availability of these CT programs across the state. So we've got um, more students participating. We have more students completing. We have more programs being offered. You might think, how can it get better? But it can. So what we have, uh, Dr. Rice talked about students who are earning college credit in these settings. So not only do we have more students attending, more students completing, more programs being offered, we have students earning college credits. Um, and we've just started to track this data. Um, in 1718 and 1819, the average uh, student earned about 5.6 college credits during their CTE experience. And you can see the numbers there, um, respective to both of those years, about 5,000 students uh, for each year, slight increase in 1819. Um, but the fact that they're leaving these CTE programs with some college credit um, is, very, uh, is very exciting as well. Again, leading to, um, we hope, more um, students pursuing additional credentials in post-secondary education. Um, this is a busy slide, but one we wanted to share with you. So this uh, shows 16 what we call career clusters um, in, the, uh, in the CTE world. And then within those 16 career clusters, there are about 50 or so, Brian, SIP codes is what we call them. Mm -hmm. They're programs that yep. fall within a SIP code. <clears throat> um, and so when you see um, uh, health science, um, is a career cluster, but there are multiple health SIP codes uh, within those career clusters. And so um, this is uh, 16 career clusters, and you can see the number of programs across the state. You'll see they add up to that 2,078 number. You've seen that. Um, and then the enrollment in these particular uh, clusters, uh, and then the number of completers. And so if you look at the higher um, uh, numbers, Regarding of the students enrolled, you can see that Business Management Administration has a little over 12,000 students enrolled. That's very popular. Health Science, uh, that cluster, 12,000. Uh, marketing, Sales, and Services, 14,000. Uh, so this kind of gives you an idea of the, the, uh, the areas of study, I guess I would say, that students are being drawn to according to these career clusters. And then again, how many have completed within those. And you've seen the bottom aggregate numbers in terms of the totals. Uh, and also the percentage growth uh, in those areas. So um, a special population serves. So the federal government um, has categories uh, regarding what they call special populations. Um, and these are duplicated counts of who um, within these special population categories are participating in CT programs. And so we see that uh, of the 110,000 or so students, uh, 12,000 of them uh, were students with disabilities. Uh, 45,000 of them uh, were considered economically disadvantaged, uh, and about 4,400 of those uh, students uh, were limited English proficient. And so to give you kind of an idea of the number of students that, uh, that we're serving within the special population categories uh, in our CTE programs. And then just to leave you before we get into um, some questions, uh, more data, more facts. Um, again, you've seen this 110,000 uh, number in terms of actual Pupils enrolled, the um, number you haven't seen is that that represents about 23.4% of all 9th through 12th graders. Um, obviously, that per, the total of 9th through 12th graders is 471,000. And so about 23% of our 9th through 12th graders are enrolled in a CT program. And when you think about it, most of our students don't enroll until their 11th and 12th grade year. So that number is a little bit skewed in terms of if, if you really <laughs> drill down to 11th and 12th graders, it's slightly under 50%, I believe. Um, with that regard to that number. We know the numbers of students that completed. Uh, the uh, uh, unduplicated count for students in special populations, again, 51,000. Uh, and then within the CT programming within the districts uh, and with the within the department, we have a variety of um, awards that we give. We call, uh, call them the Breaking Tradition Awards. Uh, and we had 91 students earning a Breaking Tradition Award this past year. Uh, four students earning excellence awards, 26 Barrett awards, and 61 additional recognition awards. Um, and perhaps most importantly, 
the last data fact we'll share you with before we field questions is that almost three quarters of our CTE graduates uh, surveyed reported that they are using the skills learned in their programs for continuing their education. And so they're gaining that relevance um, and using that relevance uh, when they leave us and either pursue a job um, or con uh, consider additional education. And so that brings me to questions for either myself or Dr. Piles. Thank you, Dr. Kenichnik, Dr. Piles, board members, questions? Mr. McMillan. Um, thank you for your presentation. I, um, I'm always uh, an advocate for broader uh, choices, so I appreciate um, CTE programs in general. Um, so you were saying, though, it's not a rigid, you're either in or out, because some take it without being completers, so they can take uh, one. Is that right? Or no, they don't, sometimes they have to take a certain number uh, of, or certain hours, you know, they, uh, because it's at a different location or something, so they're not going to go there for one hour and then go back to their, to a, another, to their regular, or I don't want to say regular school, but their home school, uh, right? I mean, they're probably going to go there for several hours. I think that varies by program. I, if, if, the, if the question is, um, so students can enroll and not be a completer. So yes, there's flexibility right. within the program. Yeah, that's, yeah. So a student that, um, that may fall into that category. So perhaps the CTE program <coughs> is a two-year program, mm -hmm. uh, but they only attend one year. They can still attend. They can okay. still gain all but that they have to be, experience, uh, okay. but, but they're not considered a completer. So yes, Okay, but they're either in the program or they're not. I mean, they're not. They, so I, okay, here's what I'm getting at is that, um, I, I, and I've asked this when the, the people that were baking, the bakers were here. Uh, you know, you, when you go into this, you give up something. So you can't take something without not taking some things that you would have taken. So I'm, I'm sometimes concerned about what they're not taking and how much of it is kind of core, you know, li um, you know liberal arts things that, uh, you know, is it reading that they're giving up? Is it uh, math that they're giving up? And, you know, I'm fine if the parent and the, and the, the student have decided that's what's best for them. But... You know, it, I'd, I'd like to know if it's flexible enough to where they can say, well, I want, you know, my child uh, is good with his, with his or her hands, and it, it would be good for them to have a couple classes, but I don't want them to miss out on some of these core classes. So, you know, and I, so I just, you know, I want to make sure that there's, I think it's important to have, it's not rigid. Dr. You, Piles, you know, would you care to share a reflection or two on that? Absolutely. So um, there's a variety of models that school districts use um, that support um, both situations that you described. And so when you look at students completing the entire Michigan Merit curriculum, there are school districts that have designed uh, courses of se sequence of courses that the students are able to complete all of their traditional math, English, science, social studies, and foreign language, and also take a CTE program. And it might be a one-year CTE program, or it might be where a student completes as an enrollee, but can't go, say, into a two-year program and become a completer. And so CTE is designed to support that. And then we also can take um, and look at uh, students that utilize the Michigan Merit Curriculum flexibility options, and they're able to take a longer CTE experience, such as a, at a technical campus that you described. And they're able to, with successful completion, uh, as Dr. Keneshek described, as a completer, they're able to also meet one year of their foreign language requirement and one year of their uh, visual performing and apart um, arts requirement and uh, the math-related requirement, which will allow them a longer experience and possibly the opportunity to dive into a deeper work-based learning experience. And so there's really quite a spectrum of options for the children across the different districts um, in the state of Michigan. Okay. And then some states have countywide systems where the student can take um, uh, shorter courses um, at the local high school level and then maybe go to a second year at the county technical campus. Um, or they can go there for the entire time. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of variety that is involved. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that can meet a lot of what students and parents are looking for. One last uh, question on this is that um, it's all after at ninth grade or after, right? I mean, there's nothing that's earlier than ninth grade because I I fought something back in the 90s called school to work uh, because you know what we see in other countries is a kid if you're not in the know and your your parents aren't well connected, you get stuck in the uh, cashier track 
uh, at fourth grade, and then you are going to be, you don't get to take classes that would expand your knowledge. You are stuck in the fourth grade or in the uh, cashier track. Not the cashiers, they're fine. I'm not, not thinking about that, but I'm just saying that they, there's track, there's slotting. So I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, they, they can't uh, be pushed into something that's uh, early on. I, I really, I'm apprehensive unless we, I, you know, ninth, 10th, 11th, 11th and 12th is my preference, but you know, it's only so, later. So as Dr. Kenneth mentioned, most of the students enroll beginning in the 11th grade into their uh, state approved CTE program. Yeah. Although there are some ninth grade options, and um, one of those more popular ninth grade options are for students who are pursuing agri-science because of the embedded nature of the core academics that exist in all of our CTE programs. We identify the mathematics and um, English language arts uh, standards and science standards across all of our CTE programs that students are receiving so that teachers can make sure that when they're teaching in that in a contextualized format, they also point out to the young people, this is how you might see this on a standardized assessment. The agri-science program is uh, very integrated, and over the course of four years, many school districts will teach their biology requirement. But they don't get it in one year, they get it through multiple years of enrollment. And so some of those programs that start earlier um, have a different type of um, embedded academic requirement. Thank you. Other, uh, other thoughts or questions, uh, Ms. Tilly? Was that, nope, that was not. Uh, Dr. Pugh, Ms. Fecto. And just um, piggybacking off of what Tom said, and thanks, Tom, for those comments, because a lot of uh, communities of color, um, and we've talked about this at this table before, um, still have in mind, you know, that CTE programs are tracking programs. Um, and I don't know if you've seen this. I know I've questioned it. Uh, I had the honor of sitting in, in place of, of Kathy Strauss on uh, one of the NASB uh, um, committees where we were looking at CTE programs. So I, had, I, I studied some of the CTE programs in the state, and it did seem as if the, the opposite began to happen, where communities of color were not taking part in the CTE programs. And we have done some impro improvements, great improvements, in making sure that kids aren't getting stuck and tracked and going right from school to the program to work um, in some a few, that something that doesn't, they don't have a future. I agree, not the cashiers are bad. People are bad uh, places to land, but it just may not have been that parent or that child's uh, best option. Um, so I guess my, my question is, are, are we looking at that? Because I have seen that where now we're seeing the opposite. And how are we addressing that? Because it's still in the back of a lot of people's minds that CTE programs could, can land my child in some place that's not going to be best for their, their future because of real um, things that really happened in the past. Well, first, making sure that it's not happening, but then also making sure that, that we're messaging better. So I can speak on a couple levels. One, um, uh, with regard to when I was an ISD superintendent in two different ISDs with CT Millages, ZT centers, um, uh, we didn't use it to track students at all. We use it to expose students to a wide variety um, of experiences um, and then allowed those students to make choices in terms of if it was a health science course, you know, if they wanted to be a physician, we certainly supported that route. If they wanted to be a CNA, we supported that route um, or a nurse. So professionally, when I was in the field, we, we never used those um, as a, a tracking um, programs. Um, and personally, and I'm um, all the three of, of my girls are in CTE. I want my son to participate in CTE as well. I think it's a great experience for them um, to really gain that contextual experience. Um, and so I haven't experienced uh, that, not saying that that's not out there. So Brian, I'm not sure your experience is with that or not. And let me make sure my, my question, I do think that CTE has improved where that's not the case, but because it, what hap it happened before, communities of color, people of color are not participating in the CTE programs in the way that their non-community um, of color uh, counterparts are participating. And it's because of, of previous happenings that I'm saying, what are we doing? Are, are we making sure that we're looking at that to see if what I've, I've collected from my data is real across the state? And, if, and once we've observed that, 
how, how are we countering that to tell um, these students and these parents, hey, this is an opportunity for your child to get ahead. I mean, it's another uh, um, middle college or, or uh, it's another experience for your child to get ahead and, and be uh, uh, further in their, in their studies once they go to college. That, so I, I agree, we've improved a lot. So um, thank you for your thoughtful comment. And uh, I made some notation here. And what I'd like to do with that is take it back and have a conversation uh, with the staff in my data unit and the career education consultants and say, hey, have we thought about this in this way? And let's look at the data and see what we're doing. And as we look to inform um, our roadmap with Perkins 5 um, and the work that we're doing with equity and special populations, that we make sure that we keep that um, as one of the items um, at the forefront of our minds make sure we're looking at it through that lens. Right, and thinking about how you do the messaging because yeah. if, if people are still seeing that as, as an issue, how do you make sure that you convince people that that's not the case anymore? Absolutely, and we've spent some time uh, with the Detroit uh, Public Schools Community School District um, over the last two years, and I can tell you that the investment that like DTE Energy and other corporations are making in their, techno in their technology campuses um, has been incredible and probably outpaces a lot of the technologies and high skill, high wage, high demand career opportunities that exist in a lot of other communities. And so I think some of the school districts have made some of their own partnership steps that they've worked toward that. But uh, we will definitely make sure that we uh, hold that at the forefront of our discussion and I'll share it with my staff. So I appreciate the comment. And as part of uh, preparing for this presentation, Dr. Rice uh, and our, and our team has talked about um, collecting what well, we already collected, but um, making sure that we're looking at those subgroups as well, whether by race, by disability, by gender, um, to your point, to see who's participating, who's right. not, and then have starting to have conversations about how can we offer more access, encourage more participation. So we are, we already have those numbers in terms of collecting them, but yes, um, in the future as we continue to move forward, we certainly going to keep an eye on that. A note in on this area that this is more of an issue with career and technical centers than it is with decentralized career and technical education programs because if they are embedded in your schools, then you don't necessarily have to go somewhere else to, you don't have to cross that threshold into another school. That's the pro. The con is you don't necessarily get those great centralized offerings that can only be done if you do them countywide. So there's a, there's a pro to the decentralized, there's a con. There's a pro to the centralized. There's a con. Actually, there, there are multiple pros and multiple cons, but relative to what you're, you're saying. Um, I had a similar reflection when I went to um, a talent center, a career and technical education center recently, that I thought that it wasn't particularly diverse for the county represented, right, that it could that. and should need, needed to be more diverse. Ms. Fecto, Ms. Snyder. Um, I just am, I'm curious um, about where you've seen the growth. So, it's particularly the 75% uh, increase um, in completers. Why do you think that is? And um, do those completers hold certifications of some sort that's recognized, or is it just completing the program? Um, I believe that um, there are two or three reasons why we've seen the increase um, in student uh, in CTE program enrollment. Um, numbers of programs and completers. Um, first is there's a nationwide recognition that there are unfilled positions that only that require either an industry certificate or an associate's degree. And across the country, there's been a lot of momentum and a lot of education helping to educate parents and families as to the viability of CTE for career. Another piece, when you look back at the way that we've been funding um, career and technical education um, in the state of Michigan specifically, is our categoricals have been increased, such as added cost, or new categoricals created, such as 61B for CTE early middle colleges, um, CTE equipment, and then some other specialized uh, programming that was developed. And so I think school districts... Um, there's a deeper interest in families and the students in enrolling, and I also believe that we've provided um, additional uh, resource for districts to help operate those programs. Um, in relationship to your question about is there a, a relationship between the number of students who have increased in our CTE programs and the number who have attained an industry credential, um, I don't know the answer to that question, and I'd have to look into it for you. I also had... Um 
So th there is a change with the, the rules under Perkins, right? So if, if I remember right, we had some discussion in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and if, could you remind me how uh, how that affects the, the kids that might have an IEP or a special ed certification? Because I believe right, in the past it was people were admitted to the program only if they, the funding was based on how many they actually successfully completed or there was some connection between the funding and the completion and therefore they didn't want to take or modify a curriculum. They might have it accessible, but they weren't going to modify the curriculum to say somebody <coughs> who might, might not be able to become a hairdresser, but maybe somebody who could do the shampoo, the cleanup and the, you know, the cash register or something like that. So, um, you know, kids that might not have um, the ability to, you know, it would be like, you know, modified to do so that kids with some limitations could have a meaningful career. And that was hard to try to get at in the past. Has that changed? Is there allowing more modification of the curriculum um, and considering them you know, whatever completers, so it doesn't affect. Okay, so when you look when you look forward to Perkins Five, mm -hmm. um, the students would still have to be able to complete all of the standards of the CTE program. Uh -huh. That component hasn't hasn't changed um, for them to get to the program com, uh, completer level. Right. However, one thing that will probably will be changing that might make it uh, the program uh, more attractive for um, a wider variety of students is we are going to now have as one of our. Uh, measurements of program quality, um, post-secondary credential and industry credential attainment. And, um, and last time I was here, we talked about stackable credentials right. and having stackable credentials as we go along the way, and even having credentials that might be created for the state of Michigan um, by an association uh, that might uh, would, would, would be there to assist. So I think that will help get to the question that you're asking, but I think further and deeper into that question, is um, with our work that we do with our with our Michigan Career Readiness Cross Sector Team, um, we just recently added um, uh, the Special Education Office to that statewide team to start looking at transition students and what are the credentials that are offered to transition students and transition programs, and how do they compare to what we're doing in Perkins, and what can we learn from one another, and how can we en better enhance opportunities for the students. Of, so where they begin and where they end. And an example could be a student could start out um, in a health science program that was on the transition side of the education house. And maybe if he or she attained first aid and CPR, then it would become time for them to come over to the CTE side of the house and work on the certified nursing assistant credential. And so more than coming up with a clean cut box of where things fit. How can we, as a Department of Education, working with that statewide team, create better opportunities for the students so that things can be customized to the young people? And I believe that we're going to feel some success as the years go on, and we strengthen those um, relationships Thank through you. that Thank through that piece right that. there. Yeah. And at yeah. the end of the day, if a student's able to get that credential and they're able to graduate and have you know the. A, a living wage for themselves, right. whether or not they get through all the curriculum and they end up with program completer status or not, it's that credential that will really matter. Right. Well, thank you. That's, that sounds really exciting so, to me. Yeah. We're excited. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Ms. Snyder. Um, I just wanted to sort of focus my response on the messaging around CTE needs to be positive. Um, the truth is it's a huge opportunity, and I think I've shared with the board before what I started out with my CNA. I got it in my 11th, or I'm sorry, 12th grade year, and it was a countywide program. It was very, it was wonderful. It was really a great opportunity. And then I went on to get my BSN, became adjunct faculty and taught, you know, maternal child nursing and did different things. And I'm here. So I, I sort of feel like students need to see, not that I'm trying to toot my own horn here, but like I'm proud of that. Like, mm -hmm. and I started with that opportunity and I really viewed it as an opportunity. So. The messaging, I think, needs to be positive along those lines. Um, and maybe they need to hear stories from other people that they relate to, that it's, the sky's the limit, this, and this is the ground floor. Go for it. 
Absolutely. Good point. We are um, we're actually putting out a um, a media release on this, and um, it's in the spirit of this is good news. Um, Twenty seven thousand to forty seven thousand um, CTE completers in the last four years is a big deal, and it ought to be celebrated. There's no question about it. Uh, Ms. Ramos Montini. I just wanted to you know, the concerns are, are valid, and and uh, the presentation is valid. And I want to tell you just a short little story of um, Juan. His name is Juan. He does my yard, okay? And he has a son named Juan, so we call him Juanito. And Juanito went to a program uh, where he learned how to be in, in building uh, carpentry or what do you call that? Construction. Construction. All right. And so the family didn't have the money for the garage that they needed to put all this equipment in. So guess what? Juanito went to study that. Guess what? Juanito built, I'm telling them to send me a, a she's calling me now, a picture <laughs> of the product that he, that he just produced together with his father and other family members. Juanito, he, is, he just graduated from high school last year. So Juanito built a garage for the family. So, you know, so uh, those are the positive sides, but then, you know, we have to look at the total picture. But, you know, I'm real proud because this family has been in my life for many years. And Juanito now, I just, I knew Juanito when he was little, and now he built a garage for the family <laughs> based on the classes that he took. That's cool. Thank you very much. That helps, um, that helps a lot of this come alive. And I do think the stories are impactful. Um, particularly told from kids' voices. So we will be sharing um, with you in one of those early morning um, presentations, career and technical education successes, because we do think that there's a value to hearing kids' voice around this programming. I think um, so much of the conversation around where we are in public education in the state is slinging assertions by adults. Um, which break down when we get kids' voice in the conversation. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, who is next? Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. The college credits earned, are those normally credits there the student goes to a community college campus, or are those um, classes that they're taking maybe at a CT center? Um, where the community college or the college has, you know, as long as you're following their syllabus, will grant credit, or is it a mixture? It's a mixture of both. And the, the key identifier is that it's transcripted credit. So it goes on the college transcript. Goes at on the, the time, At the time that it's earned. Okay. All right. Okay. The, the point of this, and, and I, I don't want to lose the forest for the trees or, or the branches or the leaves. The point of this is, is that people who are engaged in a meaningful, relevant way in their high school are more likely to be going places, irrespective of who they are, how they're born, what they look like. They are more likely to be uh, high school graduates, post-secondary education attenders of one sort or another. Um, so often uh, we have young people, they don't figure out the logic of public education, so they don't engage with us. And they realize too late that there was something in it for them. But it really is too late because light has in, life has intruded into life, and it's hard to go back and make that, that up. This trend is a very, very positive trend line for us in a whole host of ways, not simply with respect to CTE, but with respect to a large number of young people who might otherwise not have had success. Now, many would have. Many absolutely irrespective of CTE would have found their path in one way, shape, or form. But CTE helps more find a broader range of paths, and there's real value to that. It helps more figure out a dream to pursue. So we appreciate your, your up. But can I follow up on that? Please, if you'd like. Uh, yeah, because I, I um, like I said, I like the broadness, uh, giving more choices. However, I know, uh, I know our president of the board and others have said that, um, you know, they had, or maybe you shouldn't say it this way, but 
A lot of people change what they, their interests when they get to college. And so, you know, if you, you know, there is a, there is a challenge, uh, and that's why I really want to make sure parents are deeply involved and, and students with the decisions because, um, you know, they're kind of eliminating some things by doing this, going in this direction, uh, and it might be a career that uh, becomes obsolete uh, in five years. I mean, things are changing so quickly uh, with technology. So, I mean, it's something that, uh, you know, when I see these, I really am concerned to make sure that they get a foundation nonetheless, that it's not just, I mean, I think it's best, I mean, it's up to the parent and the student, but I think it's best to make sure that we can try to get them to, as um, Lou Glazer would say, they become rock climbers and not think there's a ladder and it's always going to be there and they just have to go up it because it may be gone in five years. So I really think it's important to make sure that we are uh, trying to make, you know, give them some, a broad uh, liberal arts foundation among all this. Thank you. Other, um, other thoughts? Once, twice. I, I just want to give my, my little testimony, too. <laughs> I, I started out um, in my late teens. I, I got my medical assistant certificate, and okay. I was at Hustle Hospital. And um, one of my doctor friends that I met later on in life said, you know, that's amazing because most MAs stay MAs. They don't go on to get their MBA, which I did. And... Um, it's, it is a new day and age. We have to think about that too, where before you get on one track and you stay on one track and you stay in that career for the rest of your life. Now, people will be in numerous <laughs> jobs and careers, um, probably, you know, most people. So uh, I think this is a great opportunity to give them early exposure to career ideas. Right, and, and to your point, early exposure that doesn't necessarily constrain them yeah. for later choices. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that that's true. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your... Uh, we heard the name of the hospital. Hutzel. Hutzel Hospital. Hutzel. I was in oh, labor and receiving and labor and delivery. There you Yay. go. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so, Board, this fits into... Um, Additionally, not simply with respect to CTE, not simply with respect to secondary programming, moving into post-secondary programming, but also fits into our top 10 in 10 work, that we're sharing uh, metrics with you that you can begin to consider for inclusion in our top 10 plan, which we are going to be reviewing and updating over the next six months. Last month, you saw the percentage of GSRP-eligible kids in the state who received GSRP services, 55% or 37,140 kids. Might that be a metric for your consideration? The number of four-year-olds who are eligible for preschool that receive preschool in the state. That's a metric for your consideration for top 10. Another metric for your consideration might be CTE completers. It also might be simply the number of children taking CTE. It might be both. So it might be that 110,000 student metric. It's gone up in the last uh, four years from 104,000 to 110,000. It might be the CTE completer metric going up from 27,000 to 47,000, 75% increase, or it might be the two. One way or the other, we know we're not going to get anywhere without a roadmap. And that roadmap has to include some measure of metrics. And we do well as a leadership team here to make that set of metrics the broadest possible set of metrics that we can to paint the broadest possible picture of public education in the state of Michigan. As the expression goes, just saying. And um, that's a technical term. Is, is that a, is that, do you have a, you have a question? No. No, okay, all right. And then the only other thing is after the winter holidays, we are going to be engaging more directly in that top 10 work. So we're going to move from just a, a sharing of individual data sets to a more explicit set of conversations about how we want to streamline, 
clarify um, ad metrics and move forward with the top 10 plan in the late spring. Um, so, because Dr. Kenneschnecht and Dr. Piles did such a good job, <laughs> they're not permitted to leave. They have to stay and present to us on the draft strengthening career and technical education for the 21st Century Act plan, and that is Perkins 5. Dr. Piles referred to it. Michigan State plan for Perkins 5 career and technical education is currently under development. Uh, you have received the draft for public comment and public hearing. The general public comment will be November 14th, two days from now through December 14th. There'll be additional comment uh, for performance measures and levels until July 14th. Today, a brief overview and timeline will be presented. Following the period of public comment, the final draft incorporating public comment and any changes will be presented at the board meeting on February 11th, 2020. Mark that on your calendars. Dr. Kenneschnecht and Dr. Piles, it is your show. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Rice. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to um, give you an overview of the Perkins 5 plan. This has been before you, I think, two times this year, um, the planning to plan, and now we have a plan to share with you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Piles. Thank you. Um, uh, going back to uh, Dr. Rice in the top 10 and 10, um, I would like to remind you that as we talked about uh, Perkins planning last year, that uh, Perkins planning really does fit nicely into strategic goal uh, number one and strategic goal number six of the top 10 and 10, um, specifically looking at the uh, high quality aligned system of P20. Um, as many of our students go from our secondary into our post-secondary programs and maintain that alignment. And um, we're actively engaged at the local program and state level uh, with employers and um, industry and labor organizations. In fact, tomorrow, Dr. Mahoney out of my office and I are going to be going to an apprenticeship day um, down in Livingston County to support the work that uh, the, the, those groups have been uh, providing to all of our secondary CTE programs, uh, tying right into strategic goal number one. And then within strategic goal number six, uh, working with uh, community colleges and higher education and really working on that prepared future workforce um, to help people to make sure they're informed uh, citizens. And uh, knowing that we have our partnering organization, uh, when you think of the two state agents, res agencies responsible for administrating Perkins, which is us here at the Department of Ed for secondary, um, and we're the eligible agency to receive and administer the funds. And also with our friends over at Labor and Economic uh, Opportunity, LEO, for post-secondary education. Um, and their goals um, also tie uh, nicely in with our department's goals um, in working on improving the services um, of Michigan's workforce and strengthening the CTE infrastructure um, as it exists, focusing on work-based learning industry credentials um, for our students. And so uh, we're excited uh, to see uh, uh, any uh, modifications to the top 10 and 10 that uh, provide metrics for us that will help us perform better and set better goals for um, our programs across the state. Um, as you know, we are in our transition year and you approved our transition plan last year. And that gave us a year to fully develop our plan um, you've been provided with a copy of our uh, state plan uh, for Perkins 5. And I'd like to remind you that the purpose of the Perkins Act is to develop the academic knowledge, technical and employability skills of secondary education students and post-secondary education students who elect to enroll in career and technical education programs and programs of study. And so we really do work with our programs at the secondary and post-secondary level to make sure students are understanding the academic competencies that they're learning in their core classes and how to use those um, in their chosen fields or what they anticipate to be um, their chosen fields. And it's an important component and we've been measured by that uh, since Perkins 3. And so it's something that our teachers are very aware of and something that uh, they reinforce. The plan that you received um, had really deep stakeholder feedback. And personally, as the State Director for Current Technical Education, I'm excited about the work uh, that took place. And starting with um, our State Plan Executive Committee, that group was stakeholders from across the state, from schools, businesses, industry, colleges, universities, um, and industry and labor organizations and community organizations. And we were using that group to um, 
pose questions and learn from them about how we should develop our plan and to inform our plan. And each one of those meetings left me with a feeling of exceeded expectations about the amount of engagement and feedback that we received. We intentionally um, ensured that at least two thirds of each one of those meetings were people talking to us and sharing with us in teams and not us sharing with people. Um, and people, uh, we had good attendance and people kept coming back and that's always a very clear sign that people are feeling engaged. That's our statewide group. And we did that in collaboration with Leo. So it was secondary and post-secondary um, working together. Uh, we took a different approach in Perkins 5 than what was taken in Perkins 4 and we blended all that work together because it's really important for us to have a really strong system between the two of us and if we don't demonstrate that relationship here at the state level uh, between state agencies, how can we expect our community colleges, universities, and public schools to do it at the local level just because we say that they need to. And I'm proud of the work that we've done with Leo and I think that people have noticed it and recognized it uh, throughout the process. We also had four subcommittees that worked together um, uh, throughout this process with secondary and post-secondary involvement. Um, the accountability subcommittee, uh, which uh, works on the required accountability measures for uh, the Perkins Act um, and looking and choosing um, the core performance indicator for program success that we uh, would like to use, and I'll talk a little bit about that in more depth a little bit later, uh, but we had a secondary post-secondary team, and it was really interesting because sometimes when you look at those teams, it becomes not just the people who are the stakeholders of the student outcome, but the people who are going to be receiving those students and what are they looking for, and I think that really helped us uh, get to some really strong um, numbers. Uh, high quality programs of study, that secondary post-secondary team looked at the sequence of courses a student would take starting in ninth grade, ending in grade 14, if you will, from the community college, working together. And then um, both committees, accountability and, and the high quality programs, looked at the credentials and credential attainment. And then we have a special population subcommittee that we're evolving into a broader equity committee so that we are fitting in nicely with what we're doing here with Dr. Kenneshek's work here at the department uh, with the overall a broader goal of looking at our special population categories but also looking at equity in a little bit of a larger lens as far as progr programs that are available to young people, the quality of those programs that are available to them, transportation barriers, and all of those really important pieces that we know that we need to help districts address and how can we move forward. Um, also, as part of our stakeholder feedback, um, we worked with uh, the tribal leaders um, and Dr. Jill Kroll out of my office worked with them um, and had conversation with how can we better engage and with the work that the department here is doing um, is ahead of us with tribal engagement really has helped us and we're seeing a way to really bring together those our Perkins funded regions and the tribal leaders in those regions to make sure they have some conversation and learning about how to best have that conversation so that they work together at the local level and make sure that all of the students are um, afforded all the opportunities that uh, are available in their public school uh, regions. We also um, had a conference call with uh, the charter school agency um, and a conversation uh, with them uh, to make sure that we gave them um, a level of involvement and acknowledgement and took their input. Um, they are part of the uh, state plan executive committee, but we decided to have a separate conversation as well, making sure that we were talking to them. We also have um, two different groups of individuals. One is the Michigan Occupational uh, Deans Association Council, which is called MODAC, and that's the post-secondary deans. And then we also have the Michigan uh, CPED directors, the Career Education Planning District directors. They're your 53 ISD CTE directors that work with us here at uh, MDE, but are employees of the um, ISD, and we had a lot of engagement with them. We took to, uh, went to several of their meetings and would take documents and ideas and questions for them to answer and they provided us with some real substantive feedback. And probably the, the deepest level of feedback that they provided us with was on what was called the lo Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment. And the Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment is a new requirement under um, Perkins for secondary 
ample secondary programs, and they helped us uh, design that because they're the ones that rolled out that process. And you know, we find that the more that we involve our stakeholders, when we roll out our processes, the more smoothly it goes because we've addressed a lot of what their questions are and things that they would think about ahead of time. Um, and then uh, we also worked with, I had mentioned earlier, our career readiness cross-sector team um, and the work that we're doing with them. Um, starting this week, um, as Dr. Rice mentioned, um, the draft Perkins plan will be posted on the MDE website. Um, In-person comment will be taken during a series of public hearings. Web-based comment will be taken uh, during public comment via the website. Um, as Dr. Rice mentioned, it's Thursday, November 14th to Saturday, December 14th, with an additional 30 days uh, for the perform performance measures and what were um, uh, targets and our baselines that we're going to suggest to the federal government. So once we get all this feedback and we categorize it and combine it, and then we'll use that to continue to inform um, our Perkins State Plan uh, that you have uh, right now for your review. Also within that 60-day window, we'll be providing um, the governor with a copy for her review and her input on the plan. Um, some high-level um, changes in Perkins 5 um, is the comprehensive local needs assessment I mentioned. That's something brand new for our regions and our community colleges, post-secondary institutions to complete. And where I think this really will get into uh, helping and providing um, access uh, to students um, is there's a section in there on uh, progress toward improving equity and access for special populations. And they will need to go through and conduct that local needs assessment relative to their region, their counties and the school districts within that county on what they're doing to provide um, access uh, for all of the different subpopulations that we have um, and equity. And then um, it also, there's a component in there uh, looking at labor market demand. And are we providing programs to students that there's employment projected, you know, five and 10 years out? And whether or not we're doing that, and if, we're, if the employment doesn't exist, what is the benefit and why are we offering the program? It doesn't mean the program needs to be shut down. It might not be Perkins funded anymore, and there might be another benefit to the program because it might be going into an industry that has related skills, but not just the same direct relationship with employment data. There's a lot of pieces to look at and nuances, and when you dig deep into looking at the local program um, offerings. We're also uh, new uh, within that uh, Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment is looking at the recruitment, retention, and training of our career and technical education teachers. There's a component, a component for them as you look at um, our teacher shortage uh, crisis that we're facing in our state and in our country. What are they doing at the secondary and post-secondary levels to recruit and retain teachers and how are they helping to um, grow the profession? One of our new core performance indicators will be um, the science um, assessment when it uh, rolls out under ESSA, and so that will be a new measurement for us. Uh, the post-secondary recognized credential that I mentioned earlier, that is new for us this year. Um, and we're going to be looking at all of our data from a, con from a concentrator level. Currently under Perkins 4, some of our data we look at concentrators, some we look at completers. The federal government is now requiring us to look at all the data at the concentrator level uh, to see how students are performing that are concentrators. Um, different from years before. So we presented the draft uh, to you for year review um, for today's meeting. Uh, November 14th to December 14th is the public comment. November 14th through January 14th is public comment for performance uh, measures. It will be coming back to you, as Dr. Rice mentioned, uh, with our final plan to present to you on February 11th. On March 10th, we will be asking uh, for your approval and our plan is due to the federal government on April 1st. Well, as the expression goes, that was a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, who, who has the first question or thought on that? Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Uh, could you help us remember or explain the difference between a completer and a concentrator? Okay. So um, a completer and a concentrator um, the concentrator is a student who completes up to up to, to completes seven or more units of instruction that we call segments. 
So we have 12 broad units of instruction that we call segments. You're a concentrator if you complete six or more with a 2.0. You become a completer when you complete all 12 with a 2.0 and take the technical skill assessment if available. That's Perkins 4. Now, new for Perkins 5, we have a concentrator definition which is successfully completes two or more courses. And they don't have a completer definition. So you, we would need to look at concentrator then? Yes. Just two or more yep. courses. Two or more courses. So again, I do everything by example. So if it's in marketing, it might be accounting and another course. And that would be considered a concentrator? Yes. Okay. All right. Assuming that's state approved. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's yes. got to be state proof. Yep. And it's part of their program of study. While we're talking about that, then, does the teacher have to have full certification, vocational certification? That's what I call it. I'm old, so. Yes, yes. They uh, have to have their CTE teacher certification or their annual career authorization. Annual, annual yep. authorized. Okay. Yep. okay. To deliver those standards. Okay. Which would be, sorry not to interrupt. No, that's okay. Which would be like... An example in one industry, the annual authorization, that's from through the MDE? Yes. Okay. So the annual authorization for any of the industries, it's all the same. Um, they have to have at least 2,000 hours of work experience in the last 10 years. And then there's a whole list of other criteria that add up to another 2,000 hours for a total of four. Or if they have a total of 4,000 hours of work experience, that secondary list doesn't matter. So basically two years of work experience and then, um, for example, if you're going to teach an automotive, you'd also have to be ASE certified. So if there's a required credential for the industry, you also have to hold that. Any other questions or thoughts? So Dr. Piles, did I just hear that the, um, the completion metric is disappearing, the completer metric is disappearing? Yes, we're going to a concentrator metric, but we can still have a com we can still have a Michigan completer definition. Right. The reason I the reason I ask that is otherwise you have an interrupted um, trend line. Yes. And uh, that may be fine if you don't care about the trend line, but if on the other hand there's some value associated with kids having success in life, um, Juanito, for example. Um, there's a value to continuing that trend line moving forward into the future. It also may be something that the board wants to continue as a, as a top 10 metric. So what I heard is that it is not going to be interrupted with Perkins 5. It, will be in, it won't be in Perkins 5, but that we can continue it statewide. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Mr. McMillan. Uh, you mentioned industry credentialing. Uh, what can, can you give a few examples of that? Okay, so um, the ASC certification for automotive, and there are eight different certifications to becoming a master mechanic. Anything in, anything in computers uh, like uh, or technology like Microsoft credentialing? Yeah, we have Microsoft credentialing. We have A plus credentialing, Net plus credentials. All of Microsoft. Those. I mean, I, isn't that kind of uh, well company specific? I mean, I, I I remember that was when I was a legislator. They were. Microsoft was trying to get us to require uh, schools to do their training for, for them, uh, as I view it. So I just, uh, you know, I mean, isn't that, why Microsoft? Why, uh, why not somebody, you know, it's kind of an advantage for Microsoft, isn't it? Right, so right now Microsoft offers a program in our schools that they're, fu that they're funding. When we, look at the outcome when we look at the outcome credentials, though, for state-approved CTE programs, the Network Plus, the A Plus, the third party recognized credentials are the only ones that we recognize for completion in a CTE program. And so we are looking at third party credentials like ASC, um, and then we have one for uh, welding, uh, we have one for culinary, and so we have third party rec recognized credentials as well. But the schools have asked that we include things like Microsoft as part of their stackable credential package that they could put together, but it wouldn't meet, it, meet our Perkins measurement indicator. 
So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be associated with completion or concentration, but it could be a singleton course. Correct. Or embedded within one of those other courses. Fair enough. Okay. Other, um, other questions or thoughts? Once, twice, thrice, and we thank you. Thank you. Next item on the committee, the whole agenda is an update from the Office of Partnership Districts. The Office of Partnership Districts will provide an update on the newly established zone for partnership districts located within Wayne County. This is a monthly update. Board action is not required. And here to uh, share with us, uh, I believe, Dr. Bill Pearson, Director of Office of Partnership Districts. And Ms. Gloria Chapman, Assistant Director, Office of Partnership Districts, joined by... And Cynthia McDowell-White, who is our new manager of the FAST unit in Detroit. Very good. Thank you very much. Gentle people, welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, two topics. We want to talk for a second about our uh, networking um, event that we had. It's a semi-annual event. And then talk about the FAST zone being converted to a fast zone of Wayne County. So we had a fall networking event on October 9th. Uh, we got the agenda that is there. We have these semi-annually. We had one in May. We invite all of the partnership districts up to Lansing. Uh, we were, uh, we had it at the lunch meeting. Um, Ms. Alice talked to us about the whole group. She talked to them about the history of the partnership model. And we had a lot of people engaged. On the networking results, we had 67.43% of the people said they can immediately take what they learned from the breakout sessions back to their district, and 78.3% said that the day's activities were excellent or very good. So um, going to the fast zone of Wayne County, as you know, we have uh, Throughout the Office of Partnership Districts, we have the FAST Zone Focused Assistance Support Team down in uh, Detroit working with them. Uh, our purpose has been to uh, serve as a community broker, uh, operate that satellite office, and eliminate barriers to student achievement. And we have our most of our schools in the partnership uh, districts are located in southeast Michigan, as indicated by the map. Why the zone? We want to be more targeted and intentional with our support for the 10 districts that are in Wayne County. There are six PSAs. There are four traditional districts. And as you, um, we indicated in the board briefs um, last Friday, uh, we have talked to um, the ISD superintendent, the director of the Partnership uh, Academy, uh, Dan Quisenberry, Dr. Lapia is the ISD superintendent, and Dr. Vitti from Detroit Schools uh, to be aware of where we're heading and they're in support. Uh, the zone will focus on the three MDE priorities, literacy, whole child, and P8, specifically whole child, where we want to look at uh, indicators such as the root cause of chronic absenteeism so we can work the whole county together family and community engagement, a lot of partners that we are utilizing down in Wayne County, and of course the social and emotional learning that impacts learning for our students in partnership districts. So that is our presentation. Okay, questions for Dr. Pearson? Yes, Ms. Tilly. Can we get an update on Benton Harbor on this, that situation? Sure, we'd be happy to share that under um, under a superintendent um, report from the superintendent. Yep. Other um, other um, questions for Dr. Pearson? Yes. Um, thank you. I just the general question: Is there any of the um, partnership districts that you're concerned about at this point? Well, we're through round one. And we have one district that is still off track, and we're working with them. Round two, the RGAs will occur December, January, February, March. So we'll get more information as we go through their 18-month bench benchmarks. Um, but I believe that there's going to be a few that uh, 
will be off track, yes. Translate RGAs for us, please. RGAs are the review goal attainment. That's the, those are the 18 month benchmarks that districts, uh, they provide information. We evaluate their process goals and their outcome goals. And then we collaboratively talk with them about um, what they've done, what they've accomplished. And then there's, there are metrics that we use that you know, we've provided before uh, that districts then are responsible to, according to those metrics, they'll either be on track or off track when we're done with the day's activities. But I, I appreciate you. Uh, so you. So there's a potential for a few to be off track. At this point, what, so knowing that now, what do you do to maybe alleviate that so they're not off track or maybe not as off track or is it a is it maybe on uh, the goals weren't exactly good or is there anything you, you know I'm sure you don't just sit around and wait till March and then say okay we better do something so just what, can you explain what it is that you'd be doing right now for those well trying to break down the barriers when we say that what we do is we look at what that where they are with the strategic plan do they have a strategic plan I've encouraged some districts to you know, have a strategic plan available, work with um, an entity to help them go to the community and put that together so they're more organized. Um, we focus on what type of, uh, uh, if they do, they have curriculum in place for all four, you know, areas that are going to be assessed in each district. Do we, do they have instructional capabilities that go along with that? Do they have PD, professional development, they're working with their teachers on so that they can wrap that around their curriculum and instruction? Uh, what else do we um, Principal uh, assistance in terms of providing additional support. Uh, teacher recruitment and retention. So um, is it classroom management? So we just try to, to dig a little bit deeper and try to find out exactly where those gaps are and what we can do to kind of help support and remove those barriers. As we've indicated before, teacher retention is a huge issue in partnership <coughs> districts, certified teachers. So. Thank you. But important to understand, and Ms. Tilly, I've got you. Just give me one, one second. Important to understand that while teacher retention is a big issue and while other issues cited by Ms. Chapman are big issues as well, many of these issues have as their root um, causes that are beyond the capability of a partnership agreement to address. So the issue of a teacher shortage or a relative teacher shortage may have in part as a, uh, a, as a cause inadequate um, pay for teachers. Yes. I'm reminded of the fact that um, Flint recently increased its teacher salaries and so made its entry-level teacher salary, um, I believe, $35,000. Is that accurate? I think it's a little greater than that, yes. Okay. Um, we, can, we can check that and we can share with the board, but the point is, is that it's still a pretty minimal salary for a teaching position. And, and so we, we want these um, teachers to be teachers that do the very, very best for our children. But in some ways, we're, play, we're paying below market wages to them, and we're getting, in part, what we pay. And that's not on Flint Community Schools or any other school district in the state. That's on the uh, revenue that they are given on a per-pupil basis from our state legislature. A lot of our districts, they have reduced teacher salaries because they are in deficit or they're close to being in deficit and so teachers leave. Big issue. Thank you. Ms. Tilly. The third grade reading law is going to hit the partnership districts really hard. Um, I know DPSED um, is doing things on their own, um, but overall, is there a plan to help the districts with resources for the students and then to um, let the parents know their options? First question on helping the districts, yes. 21H funds, we had $6 million again this year. We tried to allocate a portion of those dollars to districts that asked for literacy coaches and help with the third grade reading law. Absolutely, we looked at that very closely. What were all of those funds allocated? All the $6 million was allocated, yes, to, um, I think that um, 
we had about four districts that didn't request an allocation this time around, but most of them have asked for dollars and we were we provided dollars to all districts, depending on what they asked for and depending on how large they were and depending upon you know the needs that we saw that they needed. Um, and then in terms of reporting to the parents, that's really something the districts need to do on their own. Right? That we don't get involved with that. Are you giving them any assistance with that training or um, any resources to make sure so that the you know, through through MDE, they did offer um, different resources and supports in terms of you know how you actually explain the read uh, to grade three law, what that entails, different resources and supports that were available. So the department as a whole, the literacy department or our office, was very instrumental in providing those supports. Our role in terms of being Office of Partnership Districts, our PALS attended in terms of that support so that we could uh, um, offer more additional support. When it came to the uh, 21H funding piece, another thing that we wanted to look at was to ensure that those funds were utilized in a strategic way that would help support it. So we were very intentional when they requested those funds and how they were actually going to use them and what that would look like in terms of the classroom and looking at those early grades in terms of overall support and resources. Can we get a report on um, where those funds were allocated, how they were used? Because you bet. I've been speaking a lot in, in, in the community about the third grade reading law, informing people, and I want to let people know what's being done in, sure. in some of those districts. Yep. So we'd be happy to share district by district um, how those dollars have been distributed, number one. Number two, we are working on an additional communication based on the conversation that the school board had a month ago. We're working on an additional communication around read by grade three. It's going to be in, in um, collaboration with the ISDs, with the local school districts, with the local schools, pushing that message out, trying to do it in a little bit um, more friendly language, in a little gentler language, so that it's a little bit more accessible. We know we're not... Um, we know we're not um, catching up with everybody on this, that local school districts are not making that happen. They're trying. They're trying their best. In some cases, people aren't going to wake up until it's too late. And, and you know this. We've had this conversation. Dr. Pugh and I have had this conversation. Others on the board have shared their, their concerns about it. It is a big challenge. And when I was a local school superintendent, it was a similarly big challenge. Actually, it was a bigger challenge at the local school level because it is, in fact, a local school district responsibility. But we have to help them with that responsibility. We will share the dollars, but know this. How many kids are in partnership schools in partnership districts? At 100, About 140,000, 140, I believe. Right, so, what we know. We know that 62.9% of about 29,000 kids lying in Wayne County. Right. To do some reverse math, but yeah, that gives you an idea. Wait, say that one more time. It's uh, 60, it's about 29,000 students in Wayne County, which is about 62.63% of our partnership district students statewide. Well, if that's the case then. I'm not sure those two numbers sync. In fact, they don't. Um, so let's, let's get the board we'll a get number. Yeah. We'll get if, if I could, though, um, I think the point is still the same. If you had 50,000 kids statewide um, getting $6 million, if you did, um, you're talking about $12 per kid. This is not the answer to the resource question. I want to be really clear about that. Partnership dollars, however strategically shared, not the answer to the resource issue. And, and that's the most important thing. Six million dollars is not the resource issue in the state, particularly not for the most socioeconomic challenged schools in the state. If you look at school finance research collaborative recommendations and you apply those recommendations to these schools, you would be talking about tens and tens and tens of million dollars more to these schools. To educate the same, to educate the same young people, we're underfunding public education in the state, and 
partnership schools and districts are the consequence of that in part. Um, other, other questions or comments, fears, phobias, neuroses, Dr. Pritchett, whatever you choose. Thank you. <laughs> I think on slide 13, um, um, how the zone will work. Can you give me an example? You know, you're aligning it to the whole child, the literacy, the, the P8. So if you're working with a school uh, in this group, is that PD? Is that support for the teachers within that district, let's say on literacy? Or is it, can you just give me an example of what kind of work? So what's, where we are right now, we are actually defining what the work yeah. looks okay. like. Yeah, but I can tell you that the goal of the zone is for, as an office, we're serving as the nucleus for the work mm -hmm. in terms of bringing partners to the table. Okay, that's helpful. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? No, hearing uh, none. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, Approval of State Board of Education minutes. I please have a motion to approve the meeting minutes of October 8, 2019. I'll move. We have, a, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> okay, very good. Um, report of the um, president uh, this month. There will be no report of the president. Our president, President Albrecht, is not here. Um, report of the state superintendent. There was a community advisory committee meeting uh, recently in Benton Harbor. It was the second of uh, those that have, have taken place. The community advisory committee is expected <clears throat> to meet over the next uh, few months, present its report by early spring, that is embedded in the agreement itself. MDE has a representative, that is Dr. That is Dr. Pearson. Strictly speaking, Benton Harbor is not a partnership district. Um, we have a partnership with it, yes, but it's I not. I thought that they would go back to being a partnership district. They, they, they have not done that statutorily, okay? So they are in a, in a separate um, if you will, a separate bucket. And that's the only reason why I wanted to um, separate that discussion from the, from, the earlier, from the earlier discussion. I was in Benton Harbor um, 10 days ago. Um, it was my third time in Benton Harbor in three and a half months. I spent the morning with Superintendent Robinson um, walking three schools, um, including the high school. Um, it was a, a, an important experience for me. Most important in that experience was the hour I spent with young people, um, directly interacting with high school students. I insisted upon that time. I think that there's a real value to it. I don't like the dog and pony shows. Um, I'm cold to it. And kids won't participate um, in it as a rule. You run a student advisory council, you get there. Um, clear feedback, and uh, that's what I was able to to do. Um, I believe that was on November first. Uh, I may be off on that date, but I don't think so. I think that was um, Friday, November November first. Um, I'm going to be going back again before the winter holidays, meeting with the group, having the opportunity to interact. Um, in schools, get a flavor for what's going on. I will tell you, I think that they are profoundly resource constrained. I think that they are profoundly under resourced in Benton Harbor. That is not to say that um, they are um, without uh, fault. Certainly, we as human beings make mistakes. But um, they are under resourced relative to what they are trying to accomplish in the district. And uh, that's not just my opinion, although it is my opinion, it's also the opinion of five uh, school finance studies in five years, which all say the same thing. We underfund schools in the state, and we particularly underfund schools with challenging populations. So I just want to be clear about that. Uh, the partnership district model, I think, is a great model. Um, and I think it will be and has been helpful, has been and will be helpful for a number of school districts. 
But the idea that a partnership district model is the answer for under-resourcing our schools is mythic. It is most assuredly not. And that is not the, that is not the band aid for inadequate and inequitable funding in the state of Michigan. Yes, ma'am. I have a, a few questions. Um, you said the report, what will the report consist of? Um, how long before the strategic plan is developed and available? And then I was told that there has been a significant decline in enrollment this year. And how is that affecting the schools? Right. So um, the plan is wide open, that the committee has the responsibility to put whatever in the plan it wants. Pardon me, the board, um, that is to say the local school board, uh, the Treasury Department, and MDE to consider. So it can be as broad or as narrow as it wants to, to uh, it would like it to be. MDE is there. We are participating not so much from a financial perspective, although we certainly have our feelings, you just heard some of them, relative to finances, but because we are um, there to advise on academics. But as you know, academics are inextricably bound with resources. It's one thing to say you're not getting it done academically. It's another thing to have the requisite resources to get it done academically. To your question about enrollment, enrollment is, it, yes, ma'am. Was that the strategic plan? The report is separate from the strategic plan. And was is there still an interim superintendent or do they have a permanent superintendent? They have an interim superintendent. They've not selected their permanent superintendent. They are currently operating in the absence of a strategic plan. They have a direction, but they don't have a strategic plan per se. We've had, we've had a little bit of this conversation, you may recall, kind of globally um, as, a, as a board in the past. Um, a strategic plan is important, but it is particularly important around and, and with a new leader. It is hard to... Um, simply transplant a tr strategic plan to new leadership. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. And so I do think that the time to do a new strategic plan is in concert with a new superintendent. You get a new superintendent, you get that board working with that new superintendent, and they together put a stamp on their, their collective direction um, moving forward. To your question about enrollment, Enrollment has dropped. Um, the question of precisely how much is still outstanding. I did have some conversation with Superintendent Robinson about this question when I was in Benton Harbor a week and a half ago. Um, we will know better soon because we'll have audited numbers in the next couple of months. But enrollment most assuredly is down. Um, uh, down in general and down relative, um, I think, to enroll in uh, to uh, uh, projections as well. Um, so down off of last year and down relative to projections. So how is that affecting them? And and what's the plan to deal with it? Well, I will tell you that um, school districts that get into this cycle of declining enrollment, the need to cut, um, the uh, being faced with no good choices in those cuts, um, making cuts that repel parents um, and or students, um, generating additional declines in enrollment, which generate additional declines in revenue, which generate the additional need for cuts puts you in this spiral, this downward spiral. And there is very little um, that can be done under um, unchanged circumstances to arrest this decline, this, this financial um, spiral. You have to interrupt it in one way, shape, or form. There has to be a profound interruption um, in this. Either from the state perspective, and that would have to be in the funding system statewide, because I don't anticipate a change in the funding system for an individual school district. 
So there would have to be a recognition of a need to change state funding more broadly, a la the School Finance Research Collaborative recommendations, for example. That's a disruptor. That's a change in, in, this, um, in this trajectory. Another is an extraordinary change locally, but those are very, very hard to come by in the presence of inequitable and inadequate state funding. I feel like it's very unfortunate because all of the negative attention and uncertainty help play a role in in making the uh, enrollment decline even more than it already had. I respect that. I don't. I don't disagree with that at all. I, and ma'am, to to Tiffany's point, as part of the report, I guess I would like to determine if there's a way to measure the impact of all of the negative um, um, exposure that the school had on the enrollment decline. You, you, might, um, you might be able to hypothesize about the adverse impact. There's been declining enrollment in Benton Harbor for many years. Um, in spite of the absence of um, kind of the, the portent of school closure. So you've seen this decline, and I might add you've seen the similar, you've seen a similar decline in urban districts across the state. There are a couple of exceptions. They, they need to be heavily footnoted exceptions. But in general, you've seen this deterioration in enrollment across the state. There are a few exceptions. They are noteworthy but they, they do not get at the rule. Now, what you would say with your statistical training, what I might say is, has the enrollment decline sharpened? Has the slope steepened? Um, you already said that it has beyond projections. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely okay. right. So, so one, could do, one could do the math and say the anticipated slope was like this. This took that slope a little bit steeper. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, there are two issues that have to be addressed, arguably simultaneously, and in the face of inadequate funding. One, there has to be a change in, in funding, preferably a change in state funding formula, because again, it's hard to imagine addressing this issue, this single school district, outside of the way we look at all the other districts, the other 841 districts in the state, many of whom, many of which, are similarly socioeconomically challenged. Um, so that's one piece. The second piece is, is that at some point, we've got to look at, you know, you look at that declining enrollment and you say, okay, well, what's, what's driving uh, the enrollment and how might you um, arrest it at least temporarily, at least in miniature, to restabilize um, the, the district. And there have been efforts to do that in districts, but they are not so much a function of the way in which the state plans to support these districts, but rather um, efforts that are serendipitously dropped on local school districts. I'll give you an example. Um, the EAA. When the EAA closed, when the Educational Achievement Authority closed, it, it, essentially what happened was the vast majority of the EAA young people went back to what, what was now DPSCD. That helped DPSCD yeah. restabilize. In the absence of that, many of the things that have been accomplished in the last few years would not have been able to, to have been accomplished. There's no question, but there have been great things that have taken place in the last few years in Detroit. But those have benefited from the stabilization and the increase in enrollment. <clears throat> and in the absence of that, they would not have been able to have been accomplished. And I was going to ask you about you know, the debt. Um, I know that was a big issue, and that's going to make them go further into debt. 
and I know that the treasurer pro proposed to eliminate part of the debt if they would um, close the high school down. So where are they with the debt? Is the treasurer willing to eliminate any of the debt now that they are continuing on? So just, just so that people can follow along in their hymnals. We're now back in Benton Harbor, right? So we, we went from Benton Harbor, Detroit. Now we're, we're back to Benton Harbor, right? I never left Benton Harbor, thank okay. you. Yes, ma'am. But I did. I, I pivoted to the east side of the state quickly before I went back to the west side of the state. So, so in, in, um, in Benton Harbor, the treasurer has made no determination about the, um, uh, about the debt. There's been no conversation about relief from the debt. And remember, it's not a state treasurer's um, determination. It's a legislative determination. Well, no, the tr they, they were um, coming up with a deal where they would eliminate some of the debt. That was on the table. That was part of the discussion. It was part of the discussion, yes. So and they do have, have it within their um, purview to el eliminate some of the debt if they so choose to. Okay. I believe that that has to be approved by the state legislature. If you'd like, I can confirm that. I thought that Tiffany, I thought it was something that could administratively be done. I thought it had been done That's elsewhere the way in the state, discussed. but it needs to be confirmed. Okay. Other, um, other thoughts? I guess going back to the question around um, looking at the impact of all of the messaging, uh, will there be any parent type um, surveys done that will go into the report because that could also kind of like gauge, gauge what parents uh, before and after thoughts were um, before. I don't know what time of that was, uh, but post the negative messaging. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? If there will be any parent surveys that are completed. I don't know if the committee is considering parent surveys. I know that it's going to receive parent feedback. Um, but specifically to the point of surveying, I'm not sure. Um, to your point, though, more broadly, um, more than 60% of Benton Harbor young people don't go to Benton Harbor schools. And in the absence of reversing of that local trend and in the absence of more adequate and more equitable school funding, this is not a situation that's going to change. Some of that is locally addressable. Some of that is outside of local control. Can I just, what, what are the six, aren't there like six points where, where MDE able to um, recommend school closure? Is it, so and is it there, one of those sharp in, um, declines in enrollment? That's, that's a concern of mine. Right. So there's no state law that permits a school closure by MDE. Um, there arguably was a state law that permitted closure of uh, individual schools. There also was some disagreement about what that state law said. Some of us believed that uh, 1280C uh, permitted the closure of individual schools. Some of us believed it did not permit the closure of individual schools. And there was a rich debate, which was accompanied by a, a rich lawsuit on the, um, on the issue. Um, I'm not going to relitigate that now, because I know you know more about that than, than most, Dr. Pugh. Um, there is nothing, however, under current law that permits the closure of an individual school. Irrespective of whether that used to exist, it no longer exists. That was eliminated during uh, lame duck session, Mr. Garant, um, in 2018. Is that correct? All right. That said, I believe that to which you are referring are the six elements that permit MDE and Treasury to close a district. Yeah. And, and that authority exists under very, very constrained circumstances. And yes, you are right. Uh, rapidly declining enrollment is one of them. And, and that's my purpose for the questioning around. Understood. You know. 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's an important um, set of questions, and it's an important issue. It's one of the reasons um, why I've been to Benton Harbor three times in four months. Um, other questions? Um, we have uh, no report of our um, state board president. That, uh, as it were, was the report of the state superintendent. Um, report of Michigan Teacher of the Year, Ms. Kara Lougheed is not here. Um, she and Ms. Musselman will join us next month. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next item on today's agenda is state and federal legislative update. I'll turn this over to Ms. Lupe Ramos Montini, chairperson of the board's legislative committee. Uh, joined by Mr. Martin Ackley. Okay, well, uh, welcome to the uh, this part of the presentation. Um, and uh, the committee to uh, the legislative committee had a meeting on Tuesday, October 29th, and uh, Nikki was present, and I was present. And Miss Pritchett was in Ireland. Yes, yeah, she was. So she couldn't <laughs> attend the meeting. Uh, okay, and so we have some updates uh, on some of the items that we have been discussing, such as the state budget and teacher evaluation and many other uh, items, many other um, legislative updates. So, uh, Marty, are you ready to report on the updates? Always. Yep, I'm ready. Okay, thank Can I go? you. Good. So uh, we discussed at the last meeting the fact that the the governor vetoed some items in the budget to the amount of a billion dollars overall. Uh, she has been going back and forth with the state legislature on whether to um, pass a supplemental to um, refund some of those. Uh, the um, Republicans in the legislature have introduced 23 separate bills, as I reported last month. The Democrats have also introduced a supplemental bill to, to return some of the money back in. The governor and the Republican leaders in the legislature are still going back and forth on, um, on how to agree to do this. Um, demands by the House and Senate Republicans want the governor to forego her legal authority to use the state administrative board uh, to perform administrative transfers within department budgets. It looked as though the governor and... Um, the legislative leaders had come to an agreement. Um, Speaker Chatfield in the House um, was ready to go. And then the Senate Republican Caucus met um, at length, and they came out and said they're not going to agree to that deal, so they're back to you know, where they were before. Um, the legislature goes on break this week, so it won't be, and the break goes through uh, the beginning of December. So there won't be a supplemental um, passed until December at the earliest now. Um, and so all of those things that were cut or were vetoed uh, by the governor uh, remain unfunded. And so um, those issues still remain. So that's where the budget is at this time. And there are several other bills that were discussed in the committee. Um, they're outlined in your, in your handout here. Uh, one of the issues, uh, there are several bills um, that would amend or change the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Um, some that would um, count computer coding as a foreign language, others that would wrap um, some programs into uh, uh, 21st century skills. And then the, there are two bills introduced within the last two weeks in the Senate uh, that would have broader changes to the Michigan Merit Curriculum, the Senate Bill 600 and Senate Bill 601. Um, and this afternoon, um, Dr. Rice testified before the Senate Education Committee um, on that um, to give our take on it. I'm not sure if the superintendent would like to comment on your testimony. Would you like me to share? Yes, I would. Please. Sure. So Michigan Mayor Curriculum Bill, this, this bill is, is gaining legs in the, um, in the Senate. Um, there are some that have argued that it's on um, a fast track. Um, proof is in the pudding. We're going to see what's going on with the pudding in the next um, in the next couple of weeks. But um, we shared thoughts that we think after 13 years, there's some value to rethinking the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Um, it was a generational product. We've gone through a generation of Michigan school children. 13 years 
is a generation of Michigan school children. We think that there's a value to um, um, reexamining the Michigan Merit Curriculum in whole. But we encouraged the legislature to look at three things. One, to cast a wide net and get big, broad feedback from the widest range of associations and individuals and, and uh, parties, not simply in education, uh, but also in business, within the legislature, within the department and the board. We think all of that is important, so that's number one. Number two, we felt like it was important that special needs children be uh, reflected upon specifically as it comes to uh, graduation requirements. That the notion that um, special education children, special needs children should have precisely the same requirements, irrespective of their individual challenges, we don't agree with. And we think that there should be an opportunity, as there is in some other states, for a special needs child to graduate to graduate, not receive a certificate of completion, but rather to graduate um, um, with a diploma that might require some modifications that are embedded in his or her IEP. So these are not um, modifications that come out of nowhere. They're not administered on the street to tens of thousands of people. They are specific to individual children. And based on those individual needs, you would have individual modifications that could individually modify what is necessary for a diploma. In, in cases, yes, Maggie, just give me one second. In, in cases where um, there are no modifications necessary, special needs child, but no modifications are necessary to get that Michigan Merit Curriculum diploma, beautiful. But in other cases where a modification is necessary based on child's disability, then you would amend solely in that area or areas based on that disability. And then similarly, we said thirdly, that you can't eliminate the personal curriculum. You have to reflect upon that, that the personal curriculum has a relevance for general education students. It has relevance for special needs students. It is poorly understood. And to think that you can substitute uh, an EDP for a personal curriculum, um, it, it just, they're, they're not synonymous um, and they're going to be some unintended consequences. So our suggestion, um, we applaud Senator Bumstead for introducing the bill. We think that there's some value to the conversation. We think it's the right moment. It is a generational moment, but a generational moment requires a generational process to get a generational product. And that was our message today. Thank you. Yes. So um, I, I like the my son with autism is calling. I'm sure he has a question. Um, the, he could advise us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the, you remind me what EDP is? Education. Sure. Do you want to speak to, to EDPs, sure. please? EDP is Educational Development Plan. Uh, a lot of states are supposed to be developed uh, in seventh grade, and now oh, changes so the current law, so they're supposed to be revisited every year thereafter, I believe. So it's specific to um, career interests, um, those kinds of things. That's right. Not so it's like to transition. Yeah, it's, it's for children with disabilities. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. It's tied very. It's tied to the, the transition okay. IP that occurs when the student's working. Okay. So, so in I, I like the idea of having these uh, alternative diplomas. The one concern I have is um, not having access to the 18 to 26 year old services. Um, a good and point. how those would meld if if uh, this other um, I mean we have these K through 14 plans for others why uh, perhaps there can be an expanded program where there could be more time for transition you know getting that diploma but also getting some vocational services as well and to give them more just to 18 and I'm wondering if that was is being considered or uh, right, right now, it's unclear what the committee is considering in this area because there was no mention whatsoever of any possible change to graduation requirements for special needs kids. It, the, the bill was silent on the, on the issue. So um, if I were simply to look at the bill, I would say that that's not under consideration. 
Now, in raising this issue with the committee this afternoon, the committee did, uh, committee chair did share that she had heard from a parent or parents of special needs children and that she saw some value in looking into this broad area. How deeply? We don't know. It's not in the bill itself. You can't see it in the bill, in the bill language. Your, your point is very well taken, that currently, if you graduate, um, those transition services cease. Um, that if the transition services continue, uh, they do so uh, in part because you've not graduated, that you can't. So a couple of possibilities. One, you could leave that up to the parent, um, sort of embedded within the IEP process. So that's one. Two, you could kind of mix and match. You don't necessarily have to graduate at, at, at the end of your 17th year into your 18th year. You might graduate at 19. You might graduate at 20. So you might get some transition services, right. not necessarily eight years of transition services, but you might get some. And in addition, you might get that high school diploma as well. That would really be left to the conversation um, with the parent within the IEP setting process. And, and again, we've come to no particular determination about this in, in the department. We have had conversations. There, is, there are conversations ongoing as part of our path forward work on this important issue in this important area. We simply were saying to the committee, hey, slow down. Th this is a generational moment. And you're about to um, create a generational product. And you're not going to come back in a year to change your generational product. What we know about legislatures, not tours, but legislatures, is that they rarely revisit a year later, two years later. They say they're done. All the more reason to take the time to get it right on the front end, because what we do now is what we're going to have for the next several years. We got to get it right. Right. Well, I, because there's this flexibility to go beyond 12th grade in these middle colleges or whatever, it seems there should be flexibility to have some sort of a blended uh, vocational and diploma, um, even if it's an alternative diploma. Yes. Um, and even if it takes you up until you're 26 years old. So I, I, don't see any, I don't see any adverse impact to that. I mean, the reality is, is that under the current system, there are kids who, who will never get, never have the opportunity, given who they are, to get that uh, diploma, that, that the best that they will be able to hope for under the current system is a certificate of completion. And so if you get your diploma at 22, I would argue you're better off for that for the next several decades. It took you a little bit longer. So what? I have the same perspective about graduating in, in four years versus five. You know, is there a value to graduating in four years? Sure. Does everybody do it? No. Are you out of luck if you don't graduate in four years? I don't think that's the message that we want to share with, um, with kids. And I feel the same way with special needs kids in this particular issue. Yeah. Thank you. Was there any conversation on foreign languages? So, I mean, the, the answer to that is we had none in our, in our testimony. We did not talk about the specifics. The Bumpstead Bill has the same structure of core requirements. Four years of English language arts, four years of math, three years of science, three years of social studies. It has more flexibility in the interior of those core requirements, 4, 4, 3, and 3. And then it has virtually no constraints in the non-core, including but not limited to the two years of world language. Yeah. And we stayed away from that because we felt that the general exhortation that you needed to involve broadly would get a lot of people involved 
and that would help flesh out those other areas. I mean, the reality is we were <coughs> – there's a lot of texture in this, and there were a lot of people that had a lot of thoughts. Our perspective was if you simply get involvement from the two dozen associations that are waiting to speak, you're going to get a lot more texture and you're going to have a lot well, better rounded uh, product as a result. We're prepared to have a more detailed conversation when we go to the House of Representatives. But for this, I do think that there's um, a power to the engagement in the conversation. And we didn't want to lose that. We didn't want baby to go out with bathwater. Um, as a former world language teacher and as a person who aspires um, when he grows up to reteach uh, world language and to continue to learn world languages, um, I'm the wrong person to argue against world language. Okay, because I would like to expand the concerns that I heard last night at the meeting greet yeah. and also from the Chinese uh, community. Okay. As far as languages are concerned. So we'll talk some. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, more. Okay. Um, back to you. Um, that's my report. Okay. Glad I could be here. All right. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> We're glad you could be here, too. Um, any board members who wish to offer comments? Yeah. Quick, yep. uh, quick question. Uh, quick question, Marty. They, they didn't vote it out then out of committee today? Correct. Correct. They just took testimony today oh, and, um, yep. and they adjourned without, without reporting it. And uh, they won't have another meeting, obviously, now until December. December. Okay. So maybe it'll give them time to reflect on Dr. Rice's testimony oh. and, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, maybe tap the brakes a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's, that's all that's needed. Um, <laughs> before you, Ms. Before Tilly, you pivot, I'm sorry, yeah. Third grade reading bill, the retention portion being extracted, what's that looking like? I, no action expected on that at this time. Uh, the House had some um, comments about possibly taking that up, but the chair of the House Education Committee has said that um, she's not going to move anything. Uh, Ms. Tilly, report on NASB. Yes. Thank you. So we, um, Nikki, Lupe, and I went to the uh, NASB conference. And I ran, of course, you guys know, for Central Area Director. Did not win. Um, but it was a great conference. I want to talk about the highlights, okay. um, which for me and probably Nikki as well was the zoo. Um, <laughs> the bats. The, oh, yes, the bats. We went in the bat cave together. Um, but there was a school at the zoo. They used the school at the zoo as a model for us. Mm -hmm. um, it was a project-based school. They had um, early, they had ECE, early childhood um, learning. They had kindergarten. They had um, high school. I believe the middle school was in another um, location. Um, the ECE was a private school. The kindergarten, pre-K and kindergarten was public. High school was public. Awesome model. Um, I, of course, I love project-based uh, models. So that um, that particular one being located in a school, I mean in a zoo, was very unique. And it gave the kids so much exposure. And of course, um, their vocabulary was very extensive because of being located in the zoo. Um, and just the opportunities that it gives them with STEM, with science, especially environmental side, um, being exposed. Because they get to walk around every day in the zoo. Mm -hmm. And not only do they get to participate um, like we do going to the zoo, they actually get to go behind the scenes, which we did um, on this particular... Um, with the sharks. Oh, she's telling me the sharks with the sharks. We, we got we to got, see, like, inside the tank. We got to see, yes, from above, and we got a chance to see how they feed them and how they tend to them, take care of them. Um, 
there were the animal exhibits, there was an aquarium there, and there were also um, scientific experiments that they were doing. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, they were um, studying the Bermuda fern, which ended up going extinct while they had the fern. It went extinct in Bermuda. Um, so then I asked, you know, what was going on with biodiversity inside the ecosystem in Bermuda for the fern to actually go extinct there and development, the rate of development, um, is causing it. But imagine the kids get to learn this firsthand and that, that just gives them a love for our environment and a deeper understanding mm -hmm. for, of our environment and, and the importance of taking care of it. So the, that model, I, I wish that our schools in Michigan, we could do things like that, have the schools inside a zoo, have the schools inside of a museum and give them that real experience and, and make the book, the, the school books really come to life, mm -hmm. so. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. I'll add on to her report if that's okay. Okay, please. We got to meet the National Teacher of the Year. He was really cool. His name is Rodney Robinson. He is a black male teacher, and he had a lot to say about the topic of trauma. It was very cool. Um, he was just really humorous, and he was also really meaningful, and his approach is very positive. And so, you know, he went over time, and it was just kind of a delight because he just, he had just really good information. Then right after his uh, speech was an actual national organization, which I was in a hurry to get out of the house to be here on time and alive this morning, so I didn't bring that information <laughs> with me. But um, I can't remember. I'll, I'll get the national organization because their information on trauma was very, very good. It was, um, they did like a, an example of what happens to the amygdala when we're triggered, when we live, when we experience trauma in our childhood how that presents challenge and learning. And I don't know, it was just a really, I mean, it was a very good presentation. So when we talk about trauma at the board, I think that the information they offer is really valuable. So when the board may want to consider doing some trauma-informed care mm -hmm. training or participating in some ACEs training, adverse childhood experiences training, I do think that there's some value to this. Um, there's some value to it taking place among educators. Um, but it's also helpful for us to understand what educators are participating in, getting a flavor for that, seeing the value of that, um, and drum beating around it being available for more people in the state. Um, we have a... This organization would be very, I mean, I think they're, okay. they're at the forefront of that. Okay. And you are going to get that information to us? Do that. Okay. All right, cool. And in the, even in the absence of that, I mean, there are people in the state that are doing ACES training. Um, and doing it well, and we can avail ourselves of that. There's a bill that's been um, introduced, I believe, by a Republican state legislator um, on the issue of trauma-informed care and the, the notion of pushing trauma-informed care for all educators, for all who are working with our young people. And so I think that there's some value associated with that. I don't think it's a panacea, but I think it's helpful for, for people to have a sense of where a number of our kids are coming from. And a lot of what people don't understand is it's not, an, it's not a particular type of school issue. When you talk to rural educators, they're increasingly experiencing trauma among their kids in their classes, suburban uh, educators as well. So a lot of times we hear this as it's an urban issue. It is urban and rural and suburban. It's all of our it's all of our schools. Yes. I was thinking about the urban PTSD mm -hmm. yes. that that doesn't get addressed, and, and I'm sure it's you know poss possible in the rural areas and other areas as well. But just thinking about how we need to give more resources for things like that. And um, and I think educators across the state would say amen. <coughs> yeah. um, more on NASB. Going once, twice, and I'll report when I speak on NASB. Okay, very good. Um, any board members who wish to offer comments? Ms. Ramos Montini, you're, okay. you're, you're first in line. Well, my highlight for the NASB conference, it was a very good conference, very, very well planned, and 
the presenters were very relevant, had re very relevant information. But one of my highlights was uh, the presentation of the Policy Leader of the Year Award to Dr. Randy Liva. And so Michigan was all over the place, <laughs> Tiffany running, and, and then we presented the award to uh, to Dr. Lipa, and then in some of their presentations, they used us. Remember when he came and, and we were part of his presentation? So Michigan is very well known in NASPE because of our participation. Uh, so that was my highlight. I thank Sheila for traveling uh, to, uh, where were we? Oh, in Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> in Omaha. Everybody says, where were you? In Omaha. And, um, <laughs> So, so anyways, that, that was uh, a truly a highlight to put that pin in, in Michigan's corner. So that was my highlight. Thank you. Okay. Of Thank you very much. We lost a seat. Yes. Yes. But maybe that gets rectified moving forward, right? We've okay. got seven more times to No, but, well, now they're going to have just one after this term, but she'll have like four more times to run if she <clears throat> really wants to be a, a you know, a, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Dr. Pugh, comments? Okay, Ms. Vecto. Just a couple ideas on presentations. Um, it would be great to have a school that works with, um, or works with kids who are trauma uh, exposed, you know, um, what programming is good for them and what seems to be successful um, to learn and in, the, in the early morning, as well as schools that do well with special education and transition services in particular. Some models that we could. If I can just piggyback off Please, of her yes. comment and yeah. yours. I think I don't think that decision makers <coughs> understand the trauma that they cause too. So it's not just so that we understand what uh, educators are having to experience, but how do we push some of the trauma through our decision making mm -hmm. um, or exacerbated? Yeah. <laughs> Exa uh -huh. it, yeah. it is exacerbated, um, and you, you see sort of secondary trauma. Yes. And educators Absolutely. who are dealing with the primary trauma in in their young people, and they are dealing with some of the challenges associated with, quite frankly, Lansing, um, on a on a day to day basis. So, um, and I don't think that's necessarily on a year to year, but I do think when there's substantial uncertainty. So let me give you an example. Um, right now, we're, we're up in the air with respect to certain funding. Um, some people have said the budget is finished. Other people uh, know that it isn't finished, and it still has to be uh, finalized. There are districts that really feel in limbo associated with that, and that's a matter of pretty high um, stress for them. And just as adults feel the stress in the children whom they serve, the kids feel the stress in their, um, in their educators. So I think it, it, it goes back and forth, I think, to, to, your, to your point. Um, successful special education programs, successful transition service programs, and programs that are successful in working with children of trauma and or in implementing uh, trauma-informed care slash adverse childhood experiences. Yep. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Ms. Snyder. No, I'm good. Very good. Ms. Tilly. Yes, um, I don't, I'm sure we have in a meeting. I, I don't know, but I wanted to take the time to acknowledge the sign language. I don't oh, know yeah. what we call them, but it's so awesome to have them here. I, uh, I got a chance when I was small, I think in fifth grade, to study sign language. But it's like any other language, you have to have somebody to communicate with. And the only person I could was my mom. She knew, remembered the alphabet, but nothing else. So I lost the language. I think that's really good, though, that we have that here. Um, and then also, 
I want to share. Um, most people don't know when I got elected, uh, Wayne County said you can't hold office and work for the county. So I actually lost my job, lost my benefits <laughs> coming Thank here, you coming here um, <laughs> to serve and, and wasn't expecting that walking in. But um, as you guys know, I have been running the Southfield Community Anti-Drug Coalition um, part-time and I've been applying for grants. We got a grant for the summer, had an amazing summer program. And then the White House just announced that one of the grants that I wrote got funded um, <laughs> like a week and a half ago. So we got federal funding from the White House. So I'm really excited about that and all of the work I get to do in the community helping the kids. Congratulations. And you have health care. Thank you. Good. And you have health care. You said what? And you have health care. And I, yes, I will have health care again. Yay. Yay. Should always God be. is good. We should always all have health care, but that's another subject. That's another <laughs> subject. Yeah. Congratulations. Let, let's not, let, let, um, it's an important subject, and, and in 10 minutes, we can have it off camera. Uh, Dr. Pritchard. <laughs> um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Rice and the staff for the conversation again around the A to F. Um, again, as all of us have talked about, it was something we did not want, we don't support, but I think we're having excellent discussions around it and um, being able to give our feedback, and I appreciate my colleagues' comments uh, because it makes me think sometimes in a different way also, so I just wanted to um, indicate that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, second bite of the apple? I'm fine. Okay. Uh, Mr. McMillan. I uh, probably should have said this in the, not the heat of the moment, but while we were talking about ADF, but I too, uh, you know, appreciate Dr. Rice, you, the way you've done and the way Dr. Kiesler has uh, brought us into the conversation on ADF. I think it's very important and you probably needed to do it to some degree, but it could have been more slanted towards the FYI this is what is being implemented kind of approach, and uh, you haven't done that, and I deeply appreciate that. Um, I appreciate, uh, you know, even like the changing of the percentages and the comparison to similar schools, and I imagine we'll be discussing that uh, next month. Um, I heard you about uh, group editing, um, you know, and what happened with the, uh, the test preparation. Um, so that is a danger that uh, of bringing it before us, but I hope it doesn't mean that we'll see less, you know, I mean that you'll be inhibited from bringing other things before us because we might, you know, we might want to weigh in on it and make it, some changes. I, I would, and with regard to that, I feel free to push back in December on that, even that test preparation. I mean, if you guys are, are adamant that it needs to be changed, I mean, I think this is a board that would, is open to hearing that until we're finally done in December. Um, but it was a, a somewhat on the fly group editing. So I, but that is a danger, but I think it's a benefit for this board to be engaged. And I really deep, I appreciate the whole process. Um, and I do know that like we abstained and there, you know, I, I, that could be a little bit frustrating to hear you MD, you know, the law says MDE will do this. I don't think it's a state board. I know the People that the legislators that pass it don't like the state board, so I don't think they would. I, I don't remember the law, but I doubt it says state board. I think it says MDE. Um, but you know, you, you you all are bringing this before us. I think if we can make it less bad, what the legislature did, I think like on the test prep, maybe we will do that. But nonetheless, I think the expectation that I hope the MDE understands is that we don't like it. Uh, you all have to implement it because it's law. And just because we may abstain doesn't mean we don't appreciate it coming before us. Um, if we could have come, I think as a group, if we could come up with a way to make it less bad, we, we'd probably try to do that. And that's an opportunity you've given us. If we can actually get to yes, which I think we did, uh, you know, then we'll do that as well. But I don't know that the expectation should be we aren't going to abstain. It's not a, if we do that, it's not an appreciate, you know, we, it was a waste of time bringing it before us. I don't think that's not, I don't think that's the case at all. So I think it just means, you know, you guys got to do it. Go do it. We can't think of anything better to do, and we don't like it, so we're not going to say yes. So I 
trying to put that into context. I heard a little bit of, uh, you know, why are we doing this if we're all going to abstain on things? But I think that that's, that's my frame of mind anyway. And, I'd, and, you know, in bringing it before us, I'd rather not have that fight at the agenda setting committee where I, wanted, I had to do that when I first got on the board to try to force something on the agenda uh, res and do things resolutions. I'd rather it be done the way you're doing it. So I appreciate it, uh, and I, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you very much. Well, you know, the, the, the perils of doing things in group uh, can be seen in a number of uh, cases. Look at the U.S. Constitution, for example. It was, uh, it was put out there, and we've been amending it ever since. Right. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the good news. Nonetheless, I think we're better collectively than we are individually. And uh, I'd, I'd like to, I hope we will continue to act in that, uh, in that way. Future meetings. For those of you who are excited about future State Board of Education <laughs> meetings, and they are truly riveting. Um, so the next three riveting State Board meetings will be on December 10th, January 14th, February 11th, 9.30 in each case, all in this room, weather permitting. I'm so delighted that each of you uh, managed to get here um, today. A number of us had uh, some adventures making it, and uh, so I'm glad you were able to um, make it. Do you have a, a pre-benediction? Yes, I okay. do. I, and I didn't know, did we take off future meeting topics? Um, well, Ms. Becto shared um, uh, a couple. Do you have a couple as well? Well, yeah, I was thinking of the, the um, person that gave uh, public comment and then the opportunity that I had, uh, Bridge Magazine did a, a session on substitute teaching. And if that could be an item, if we haven't done it already, I don't think that we have. But uh, well, and, and just to, so, so I heard the one. Tell me about, um, do you want it to be on substitute teachers, which is in some ways symptom, not, not cause, or do you want it to be more broadly on the issue of? More broad. And, and thank okay. you all for, yeah. for preparing uh, notes for me very quickly. Um, but yes, more broad. Okay. Um, all right. Because we're happy to have the conversation about long-term subs, but I just happen to think it's a piece of a broader issue. Right, and, and we, keep, we keep talking about the broader issue, but we've just not spoken about it um, from that angle. Yes, Happy. teacher shortage, mm -hmm. um, making sure teachers are, are staying, are well, have good health insurance, mm -hmm. uh, so on and so forth, as well as what we're doing to support, um, adequately pay, so on. Um, it's an important area. Our, yeah, okay. Any other, any other topics for subsequent meetings? I, I will send some. Okay. It came out in yep. a meeting brief last night. Okay, thank you. Um, hearing none, if you do have, just shoot me an email, a text, a, a telephone uh, call, do what you do to get in touch with me. Um, but um, hearing nothing else, um, we are adjourned at 326. Thank you. Thank you.